Amen, amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you guys are doing well. As my screen suggests right over here, my name is Jaden, and I get the opportunity to preach to you this Friday night. Now, these are exciting times as the holidays draw nearer and nearer. We get an opportunity to spend time with our loved ones, eat some delicious, scrumptious food, and take a break. I know uh, for any students among us, uh, we, we're waiting for the holidays, right? The holidays are like the end zone, right? It's like, it's like the touchdown. It's an opportunity to get that much needed rest after all that hard work you've put into your classes, into your tests, into all of your studies. I know for me, uh, when I was an undergrad, the holiday season always felt like a sanctuary, right? It was like a stress-free zone. Because I mean, school is tough sometimes, you know? And, and there'd be semesters where I'd roll into the holidays just feeling like I conquered the world. Other times, amen, it felt like I just escaped like a burning building. I don't know how I got out there. I was, you know, uh, crisp clothes, shocked and confused, but I made it. I really hope that uh, none of you guys can relate. Nevertheless, uh, no matter how we're walking into the holidays, whether you're at the top of the class or you're just fired up that C's get degrees, it's important to go into them with clarity of purpose and a healthy understanding on what to expect, especially if this is your first time going home. The title of my very short charge is Tis the Season. Now, you know, uh, for many of us, it's our first holiday uh, season as a disciple. And every other holiday has been just a little bit different. It's been a chance where we get to go and chill, right? Uh, we get an opportunity to let the old noodle cool down, catch up on some lost sleep. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's going to be time for that. But as a disciple, uh, that can't be all that our holiday seasons consist of. You know, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, uh, Jesus is preaching and he's teaching. And he looks around at the people uh, that are gathered there and he's filled with compassion. Right? He sees that they are harassed and helpless. And in verse 37, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. See, for, uh, for a lot of us, the holiday season is a very cheerful time. However, I'd also say that for a lot of people, it could be a very difficult time, right? There's a lot of cheer. Uh, there's a lot of happiness and joy going on on the outside. It can sometimes be a stark contrast to all the loneliness and, and the hollow and the pain that goes on in some individuals. And it really helps to highlight that. This is why the holiday season can be an incredible opportunity to help someone come into a relationship with God and have their soul saved. To get a better understanding on what our mindset should be going into the holidays, I thought we would take a look uh, by beginning to look at the mindset of Jesus. My very first point is the reason for an evangelistic season. Mm. It is. Come on, bro. Oh, Feed us, bro. Feed us. Get like a, a fuller picture of Jesus's mindset. We would need a lot more time than I'm allotted to right now. So I'm going to take a little bit of a Tommy gun approach, right? I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures at you, but then I'm going to come in for a landing in Colossians chapter one. If you want, you can turn there now and I'll meet you right over there. Now I'll be come touching on. on some scriptures rather quickly, but I do recommend that you write some of these down so that you can take a look at them later and study them out on your own. Come on, Jaden. Oh, bro. Man, feed us, bro. Feed me, bro. Now, remember, oh, we're on, trying bro. to understand what our mindset should be for the holidays, really all the time, by understanding what Jesus's mindset was. In, we're going to pick it up in, uh, in Mark chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. Uh, just write these down. Mark chapter 1 is the beginning of Jesus's ministry, and we read in verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you a fisher of men. And even in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he calls others to be a fisher of men and to follow him. Very shortly after, in verse 35, we pick it up. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went into a mm. place. Simon and his companions went to look for him, but when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. To the nearby villages so i can preach there also that is why i have come we see that jesus wakes up very early in the morning and he has a solid quiet time which is why jesus is able to later have uh, be very resolute about his purpose this is why it's super important super critical that you have strong i'm sorry strong quiet times even in this upcoming season 
right Come after on. he says, let us go to preach, for that is why I have come. He has seen his purpose. Matthew chapter 20 in verse uh, 28, the Bible reads, uh, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life uh, as a ransom for many. So very clearly in the scriptures, we see that Jesus didn't come to take. He came to give. Not just what he could, but all that he had. He gave his very life for the very purpose of saving souls. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. The Bible on, reads, for the bro. son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. I doubt this one needs a lot of explanation from me. It pretty much explains itself. Jesus came for the lost. First Timothy chapter one. In verse 15, the Bible reads, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And there's so many other scriptures that help us see what Jesus was really about, what his purpose was while on earth and his attitude towards it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now you're thinking, well, that's awesome, right? That's great for Jesus. He's such a swell guy. But the, the attitude that Jesus has actually affects us a little bit more than you think. Now let's uh, meet together in Colossians chapter one. We're going to be starting in verse 15. Come on, Jaden. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. Obviously, this is just loaded with so many nuggets, so much truth, right? It tells us that Jesus is the image of God. He created all things, and in Jesus everything is held together. However, the part that I want to focus on is that last bit there, uh, where it says that he's the head of the body, and the body is the church. See, the church is comprised of each and every one of us who has repented uh, and has been baptized into Christ. We are the body, and that's why it's super important for us to know what Jesus' purpose, the head, was, because that trickles on down into his body, us, and it gives us purpose. See, it's very important that the head and the body are unified. Because if it's not, we run the risk of running around aimlessly, and a headless body doesn't survive for very long, and eventually it dies. On top of that, a headless body running around is a very, very freaky situation. Um, I've actually uh, seen it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if uh, many of you guys know, but uh, I was actually born in Mexico. Um, I came to the United States when oh. I was three years old. Uh, but I get the opportunity to visit Mexico often, especially when I was younger as a kid. Uh, my grandparents have, uh, you know, some land out there. So I'd go for summers. Uh, I remember this one time when I was six years old, uh, my brother and I stayed uh, with them for some months. And the culture and lifestyle for, uh, of where they are is very different than American culture. Uh, they're in a very remote place. So to get anywhere, uh, you know, to get groceries, you have to travel a considerable distance. So there's a little bit more thought uh, that goes into how we're supposed to ration our food mm. and all of that. Um, you know, um, if you want chicken, you, you got to kill a chicken, right? You got to cultivate chickens. And on one day, we were going to have chicken that night, right? So my grandpa took me and my four-year-old brother out with him, and he took us out to the yard where he had a bunch of chickens. I thought, oh, look, chickens. We don't have a lot of these where I'm from, right? I lived in the United States at the time. Um, and then my grandpa comes, and, and he pulls out a log, right? And he gives me a machete. And then he grabs a chicken, he puts uh, his neck on the log and he says, okay, cortale la cabeza, which means cut off its head. And I said, yeah, but he insisted. And I kept telling him, no, 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 grandpa, no, see, I don't want to kill chicken. It's okay, it's okay. But you know, the culture is so different that he was, he just kept looking at me like super confused, right? Like he couldn't wrap his mind around why this grown six-year-old didn't want to decapitate a chicken. <laughs> Come on, bro. Right? So he's all like, andale, andale, tenemos muchas cosas que hacer, which means hurry, on, hurry. Bro. There's a lot that That's we still right. have to do. So I caved, gave him to some peer pressure. Uh, and I took the machete, all right? Uh, and I was walking up. I looked the poor chicken in the eye. I closed mine. And then I just swang, right? I swang with all of my might. Unfortunately, I ended up just whacking it in the head a little bit. Like, oh. <laughs> I dropped the machete and then I ran back, right? I said, I can't do this, right? I know my grandpa was super disappointed. Um, 
of course, my younger brother was there and he has to go and show off and he takes the machete and just in one fell swoop, just cuts the thing straight off, you know, whatever. Um, but as my grandpa kept cutting off the heads of these chickens, uh, he would put it, their bodies in a bucket, right? So that my grandma could later go and defeather them so we can eat them. And uh, he was almost done um, until, and I kid you not, right? True story. One of the chickens that was all the way at the bottom of the bucket just jumps out. And I don't know what possesses it, but he jumped out and he started running around. Chicken corpses were flying everywhere. He was running around in circles, doing donuts. I was terrified, right? I had never feared so much for in my life. Honestly, come to think of it, it was probably the one that I whacked, you know, coming back for some revenge, like, ah, you hit me. Um, all in all, it was a very terrifying uh, experience, right? I remember even becoming vegetarian for a bit after that, you know, until we got back to the States. But my point is that oh, the head and the body are meant to be unified, right? They're meant on, to Gina. be together. And that's why it's so important for us come to see what's important to Jesus, because he is the head and we're the body. You know, the temptation this holiday season is to chill the entire time, but we oh, see that Jesus' focus was always on the last. You're going to have the opportunity to share your life and the gospel with your friends and family. Now, you'll need to be tactful, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my next point, but we've got to be about our purpose this holiday season. Come on, my, Come on bro. My Come second dude. point is, tis the season for treason. Now, bear with me with that title just a little bit. <laughs> I know it sounds out there, but I'm not suggesting that for Christmas we all go and overthrow the government or anything like that. Come on, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. It's just, you know, it was a word that, I, that, that rhymes with season, so I put it out there. But what I mean is that a lot of us are going home for the holidays for the very first time since you became a disciple, which is great, right? However, I, I'm sure that sometimes going back home, the thought of a new disciple could be something like, wow, I'm going home. And now I'm a Christian. Oh boy, oh boy, mom and dad are gonna be so proud of me. I'm not cursing anymore. I'm not getting wasted. I'm not going for a walk in the park before we start eating. This is the best. I know that they're gonna be so fired up for me. And they may be. However, on the off chance that they're not, go over with me to First Peter chapter four. Come on, bro. Let's go, Jaden. Come on, bro. First Come on, Peter. Jayden. Chapter Come four, on, we're going to start in verse Come on, bro. one. Come on, bro. Next level, bro. Therefore, Christ, bro, since right. Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for his evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Drop down to verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. See, uh, the, the, the treason that I was talking about doesn't actually come from us. Typically, it's against us. Scriptures teach that whoever wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, for us veteran disciples, we have a, a, a little bit of a better idea on what to expect during the holiday season. We've went out there, we've made our mistakes, we've kind of tested the boundaries, scraped our knees a little bit, and, and, and we're geared up. I think uh, for those of us who are going there for the first time, you've got to understand that your lifestyle will challenge those around you. On, right. What, whether religious or not religious, people will usually find something to pick at. You know, at a non-religious gathering, they may be confused as to why you're not, you know, living your best life anymore. Right. Uh, they're, they're confused as to why you don't join them in the course talk, the gossip, the slander, the intoxication. You know, and they may poke at you a little bit like what? Like, well, now that you're a Christian, you think you're better than us? Oh, Reverend, <laughs> which obviously is not the case at all. You're just there. You want to just have a fired up time with them, eat some turkey or some tamales, whatever Thanksgiving you're having. Um, but as the scripture says, sometimes they're so surprised that you don't join them that they begin to heap abuse on you. Even in a religious household, your zeal and heart for God may challenge the lukewarmness in the room. And the spirit may be something like, okay, all right, Junior. I know you're kind of new with this whole Christian thing. And, you know, I remember my first communion, but, you know, just take it easy. Take it easy. This Christian thing, it's, it's more like a marathon 
and not a sprint. So you don't have to do it all right away. Right, either way, it's equally as dangerous. I remember going back for Thanksgiving, my first year as a disciple, and man, I kept getting grilled by my atheist cousin. Right, I was like 19 years at the, at the time, highly emotional. He's like 26, master in psychology. And he kept poking at me, right? Making fun, arguing. And we turned it into kind of a big deal. And it really ended up hurting the gathering a little bit more than helping it. Now, of course, that may not be everyone's experience, right? It varies. However, you've got to expect the unexpected and make sure that you're staying connected with brothers and sisters so that if something does happen, you're ready and you've got your discipler on speed dial. Talk about you know, it. Every opportunity is an evangelistic one, if you see it that way, even the holiday season. I will say, though, especially when it comes to evangelizing the family, there's a certain way you've got to go about it. You know, some of us uh, were very zealous and that's incredible. You know, keep up the zeal, do not stop. But I guarantee you that at least someone on this call is going to make the mistake that I did, right? And that's going into the, into the family gatherings, coming in hot, right? Locked and loaded, guns a blazing, you know, walking up to family members like, hey, repent or perish, you know? Uh, hey, you know, you're not really a Christian, right? Uh, hey, don't be a heathen. Right, preach right? And, and, and doing that, like, this, we've got to have right. tact. We've got to have a, a wisdom when we approach these situa uh, situations. Otherwise, we may run the risk of, you know, hurting people rather than bringing them closer to God. I know because I've been there. Learn from my mistakes. Talk to your discipler and set up a plan on how to go about evangelizing your family. Understand that not everyone is going to be thrilled that you're a disciple, but have the faith to know that God has placed you, God has picked you, and he's placed you where you are so that you can be the light to your family or wherever it is you're gathering for the season. All in all, guys, the holiday season can be an incredible experience as a disciple, an amazing opportunity for you to share the gospel both directly and through your life. Let's be unified with the head and know that our purpose is not to check out this holiday season, but it's to check into the mindset of Christ. Be strong and courageous, do not let persecution get you down, but rejoice that you've been uh, counted worthy for suffering for the name. Keep your discipler on speed dial and let's win this world for Christ. Amen. Amen. Come on, Jaden. Come on, Jaden. Come on, Jaden. Come on, Jaden. Come on, Come on, Ashton. Come on, Ashton. Let's go, bro. Okay, my laptop just blacked out, but we back. Uh, you know, I appreciate Jaden a lot. You know, tis the season right there. And it reminds me, it's so funny. He said, going back home, guns of blazing. And it's really funny because that, that's exactly what I did. Um, and I think a lot of it is because we want to be great as a people. But the issue is, I have what's called a ticket phobia right there. Uh, ticket phobia is the fear of making a mistake, it is the fear of failure. Or maybe you have a telephobia which is the fear of making any little type of mistake, AKA perfectionism. And I truly believe that this is the society that we grew up in. This is the society that we currently live in. Sadly, a lot of times we could bring this same phobias into the kingdom. It can still impact us, but family, I'm here to tell us tonight that they do not have to. Turn with me to Proverbs 24 and verse 16. Come on, come on, come on, bro. The classic scripture right here. It says, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes, right? We always read this scripture like to encourage brothers and sisters to, hey, if you fall down, get right back up. And we read this scripture and it guarantees two things for us. The first thing it guarantees is that those righteous men and women of God, the righteous who wake up in the morning and have great times with God, the righteous who go out and share their faith and live out their purpose, the righteous men and women of the Lord will get up even though calamity may strike. Come on, bro. But the other part we have to see here is that it's an absolute guarantee that you will fall, that you will fail, because you can't get up unless you fall down right there. Yeah. But what on, really matters is if you actually get up or not. And we know the apostles, man, they had anything but a 100% success rate. I mean, there's times where they couldn't cast out demons. They're supposed to be like the big, the big dudes on the block. They're supposed to be the D1 football players at Cal right there. Amen. Shout out to my brothers over there. They're supposed to be the big guys, and they fell away from Jesus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But they flat got up and were able to evangelize the nations in their generations. 
you can never get back up if you don't fall. And tonight, you know, this scripture, we could talk about the aspect of getting back up. But to be honest with you, I really want to talk about the art of the fall when we fall down. And as a people, man, we're, we're just afraid to fail. Come on, bro. We don't want to hurt our reputation. We don't want to hurt our parents' feelings, someone else's feelings. We don't want someone to be embarrassed of us. We could feel like a burden. We could be insecure. And man, I used to live like this in a great way. I was a great people pleaser. And it, it's such a crippling, uh, just a fear, just living in a constant hesitation. And so you can even think of this. This probably happened to some of us today. We go over to, you know, Safeway. Maybe we're just getting some food or whatever else it may be. And you see that guy or gal you're going to go share with. Them. And you're like, no, they might say, no, you know, he's a little bit older than I am. Da, da, da. And by the time, if you even make the decision to go and share your faith, person's in their car, they drove away. And the only hope they have for salvation on that day did not share their faith with them. Brothers and sisters, let us not live in hesitation. And so when that happens, we, we feel that failure. It, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. And so as a result, we begin to then pull our hearts back, begin to give less effort. We begin to make excuses to cover up that failure. We do all this. And what does this all culminate to? Now our pride and our ego is at the forefront of our work ethic. It keeps us from giving us our whole heart or giving our whole hearts rather because we hate the word failure. On, but family, on, as sons and as daughters of the living God, I want to invite you all to absolutely fail harder. And that is the title of my lesson, Fail Harder. Turn with me to Matthew 14. Let's go, bro. We're going to learn how to fail harder tonight. Matthew 14, verse 25. Very popular passage. Many people know about this one, even if they're not religious. But in verse 25, Matthew 14, it reads, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Just so cool, man. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have a little faith. He said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed to the boat, the wind died down. Now, as we said before, very famous passage. For the most part, if you haven't read the Bible, maybe you heard about this somewhere, that Peter walked on the water. I know a lot of times when I read this scripture, I usually focus on like, okay, you know, I got to have some faith. I want to walk on the water. If I want to stay on the water, I got to have some faith. But I never really analyze how fantastic of a miracle that Peter just performed. In the midst of a storm, I don't know about you guys, I've been taught to like stay in the boat. I'm like, okay, seatbelts on. Like, what can I use to stay on this thing? I'm not trying to fall out. And then could you imagine you're trying to get all your stuff together, stay on the boat during this storm, and Peter's like, all right, cool, I'm going to walk off. Road. Whoa, that's the last thing we should be doing. But Peter walks off the boat in the midst of raging waters, and he slowly starts to walk on the water. See, Peter took a risk. Peter was willing to fail if that's what it came to. And because of that risk he took, because he decided that if he was going to fail, he was going to fail harder. He, along with Jesus, are the only two men can say they've ever walked on water. Come on, bro. This doesn't Come happen. On, bro. This does not happen if Peter's not willing to make a mistake. It's a vulnerable mentality that Peter must have. And he had that mentality of, you know what, if I'm going to fail, I know I'm going to mess up, but I will fail harder. And then I begin to think about the other disciples in the boat. There was, hey, all these people are supposed to be God's all-stars, all essentially. But in verse 26, it says that they were absolutely terrified. There's that crippling fear. And Jesus said, hey, I'm out here. God, it's me, I promise. How do you not know my voice? It's been years we've been hanging out. But they're crippled by their fear. They didn't trust, they didn't believe, and they didn't want to take a risk. So they stayed in the boat. The question then goes for us, will we stay in the boat and live based off our fears? Or are we going to put ourselves out there and give us a shot at walking on the water? You know, an uh, uh, instance recently that happened to me a couple of Tuesdays ago now is uh, I almost stayed in the boat, guys. I almost like was like strapped in. So normally some SF brothers out here, we go play basketball Tuesday mornings. We begin some buckets. It's been awesome. Um, there was this one Tuesday, literally nobody could go. And I was like, you know what? I still kind of want to go get some exercise in. So I went and I was kind of shooting around and I noticed this guy. Um, and we all know how it goes. Like you're kind of doing something. 
and the excuses start just running off my head. I'm like, okay, I should share with them. Oh, we got headphones in. Oh, he's a little bit older than me. Da, da, da. Long story short, I literally basketball shoes, basketball, everything's in the car. I'm about to leave. And I'm like, you know what? I, I got to get out of the boat right here. And so I go back, share my faith with the guy. He's actually open. I was like, okay, who's open? Next thing you know, the man studies the Bible and he gets baptized. And Ina Harris Jr. is downstairs wow. in the 88 right now as Come we speak. On, That's good. We had to get on, of the boat. Oh. See, I found, I found myself I obsessing it. over perfection while forgetting the process of imperfection it takes to get there. You know, funny enough, if you think about it, wow. imagine if Peter did fail. Like, Peter would have looked mad stupid. Like, in the middle of a storm, he walks out the boat and falls into the water. But let me tell you what, at least he trusted, at least he believed. And that's much more than the other guys can say. See, both parties failed. Peter, he was walking on water for a little bit, couldn't keep the faith, he sunk. But at least he got out of the boat. Family, I want to invite you to fail harder. Come on, bro. You know, on, bro. one of my favorite uh, YouTubers back in high school, so last week, no, I'm kidding. Um, back in high school, his name's Trey Good. Ah. And he's a basketball channel guy. And so he said this, yeah. he had a conversation with a basketball player, it went like this, he went, you know, this basketball guy came up to me and he asked me, how many free throws did I miss that day? I said, 14. Well, then I, he chuckled. And so I asked him, well, how many did he miss? He said, zero. Well, then, Trey, good that is, he asked him, well, how many free throws did you take? He says, I shot 15. Trey goes, well, I shot 100. Sammy, I want to invite us to fail harder. I know some of us here are scared to be leaders in God's kingdom. It's not because you don't think you can do it. It's because you're afraid to fail at that spot. God is calling you the same way he called all these guys in the boat. Peter was the only one answer call. He's calling everyone right now to be a leader, to be a discipler, to be a campus minister, to be a Bible talk leader, and Lord willing someday to be an evangelist. And if that's something you don't want to do because you're scared and you're feeling that failure, and so you want to hold yourself back. Oh, I don't want to feel that hurt. I don't want to put myself out there. I want to stay in my boat. I'm sorry to say, family, but you are only taking 15 free throws while Peter and all the rest of us want to grow in a great way. We want to take 100. Are we going to fail some more? That's Come true. Come on, bro. You better man, go God wants us Come to on. walk on some water. Come on, bro. I want to invite go you Let's go. to fail harder. My family, the goal, the dream, the objective is 100 souls, one for the Lord. 2020, Satan's going to try to tell you, no, COVID, you're, you're not going to do it with COVID. The holidays are coming up. No one's going to be home. Finals are coming up. People are going to be too busy. So why should you even get out of the boat? Let me tell you why, Satan. Because God says he's here. He told me not to be afraid. He told me to come to him, to get out of the boat. And even if I do fall into the water, I will fail harder. Family, I want to invite you to fail harder. My second point, my failures won't define me. Mark 14. Come on, bro. Come on, Ashton. Let's go. Oh, Ashton. If I can get there, that'd be awesome. Come Mark on, 14 and verse 27. Bible reads here. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away. Come on, man, I'm not. Come on, man. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice. You yourself would disown me three times, actually. But Peter insisted emphatically, even I had to die with you. I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. We see here, arguably, one of the greatest fails, if you will, in all of the Bible. We get the macho man. We got the all-stars and the apostles. And Jesus correctly predicts them disowning their best friend. But we get another view here is that Jesus actually expected them to fail. And amen, if Jesus knew they were going to bounce back right there, but he 100% expected them to fail. Even in Luke, if you look at the other passage here, it says that Jesus prays that Peter wouldn't fail, knowing that we need some prayer right there to not fail. We want a little bit of help, that he's praying for us not to fail, but he knows that we will. See, God knows we're going to mess up on the way. Jesus wants us to shoot for perfection because that is the goal, but he knows there are going to be some bumps and we all fall short of the glory of God. But that's what makes this walk so awesome. Without any of the bad in our life, we wouldn't even know what a good is. You know, the realization that I came to this is realizing that it's okay to fail. I remember I just started leading a Bible talk. Shouts about already right there with Cara. And uh, I was going in. I'm like, yo, we're about to dunk so many cats, like evangelists, cops. Like, we're going in. This is going to be great. We was baptizing nobody. It was, man, it was rough. 
Um, and I remember Car and I, we walk into the D group with Fernando Jackie, like beat up, straight beat up. And we're trying to say like, oh, I think it's this, I think it's this, da, 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 da. I remember Fernando said this thing, I'll never forget. And I tell Car this all the time. He says, guys, I 100% expect you to fail. And it was like, like shackles just freed me. I was like, oh my gosh, that's all I need to hear, man. I, I gotta, if I'm going to play quarterback, I just want, let me just have the opportunity to sometimes throw some interceptions. Like, Hey, I want to win some games, but to win some games, I got to take some risks right there. And so we had everybody sharing their faith and Lord, and obviously God blessed it. And we did see some fruit come out of the Bible talk. Do not let your failures define you. Let's this go. is sadly the mistake that Judas made. Judas allowed himself to define himself with his failures. And sadly he took his life. Peter didn't allow that to define him, but he allowed it to motivate him. You know, with special missions coming around, I can't wait for Sunday. You know, usually Jason gets a, a nice little envelope with the amount of money, but maybe this year will be a nice little email because of cover right there. And I can't wait to hear the amount of money we blew out missions by. But maybe as I say that, you're like, well, you know what? I'm unable to hit my missions. Actually, I didn't hit the last missions either. Well, I'll tell you what, make the decision tonight to door dash as much as possible, to sell some stuff. I'm going to lift up Alyssa Rose, who's doing some car washes right there. Shout out to my sister, Alyssa Rose, going Come after on. it. Let's and amen, maybe, you don't, maybe you don't hit your goal, but you're like, man, I, I surely tried. Well, let me tell you what, you are partaking in failing harder. Bro, sis, I want to encourage you to keep doing that. We oh, learn from our past failures. We take those things, we use the experience, and we then go smash our miss. We go smash whatever mountain Satan thinks he put in our way because God's going to absolutely level them. On, but let's close out here bro. in Psalm 73. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, in Psalm 73. Let's go. Psalm 73 and verse 26. Very comforting uh, passage here. It says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What did we really learn today, family? Bottom line, failure is borderline a guarantee. No refunds. It's 100% a guarantee, but God is still the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. If you see yourself as a failure, you got to stop because God doesn't see you that way. God sees you as a, as a son or as a daughter who's absolutely just genuine and awesome, but you're just going to mess up sometimes on the way, the same way that Quaker looks at all me. He's like, Hey, you're really cute and you're really awesome, but I'm, you're, man, you've been messing up, man, the same way. God looks at us when he looks at his children. See, guys, failure is a way we learn. Oh, failure is a result of your best effort. Show me someone who gets everything right, and I'll show you someone who isn't taking risks. Show me someone who doesn't make mistakes, and I'll show you someone who isn't growing. Show me a disciple who gives all their heart, fails super hard, but gets back up and does not let that failure define them. I'll show you a sold-out disciple. Fail harder now so you can easier succeed later. Come My on. family, Come I want to invite all of you to fun. fail harder and to God be all. Come on, Ashton. Let's go. Let's go. Hate Andre. Let's go. 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 I want to give it yeah, up for uh, Ashton Hughes, uh, team captain of the 88 Choir. You guys did a fantastic job. <laughs> you know, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christoph Mabla, and I hail from the That's UC right. Berkeley Campus Ministry. Yeah. 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 For those who are still with me, I will be closing us out tonight. But really quick, I want to see who I'm preaching. Bring us home, bro. Let me see. Come on, bro. Faces. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Oh, I'm captivated. Amen. <laughs> well, a little Bible study for us. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Come on, Stav. Let's go. Preach the word, man. Genesis Let's go, Christoph. It's towards the front there. And we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible reads, In the beginning, God. And you know, we're going to stop right there. <laughs> the first four words of the Bible is in the beginning, God. In the beginning, dot, 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 dot. You see, the Holy Spirit who wrote the scripture saw fit that the moment we open up the Bible and we begin to read, the very first thing we see within the very first sentence 
is God and his nature. That it all begins with God that even before it all began, it was just God. Just God. Come on, bro. Existing, present, and utterly perfect. This is the God who was, is, and will be. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you see the very first sentence of the Bible lets us know right off the bat exactly who we're dealing with. That this God created time, beginning, space, the heavens, matter, the earth. God was before the very elements that make up all creation and he wields them in his hand. And you know, I share this scripture because this world, this plane of reality, as we know, it all started with just God. And in the same way, we got some disciples on the call tonight. All of us, we embarked on this highway to heaven because we just really believe in God and we really believe in his word. Come on, bro. For us in the beginning, it was all about God. But I believe, naturally, we start to drift away from that first love. Come on. And if we're going to stay faithful to the very end, we're going to need to learn how to fight and go back to the beginning. And so the title of my lesson tonight is In the Beginning, God. I have two Come on, bro. Come on. Hey, so, bro. To make it to the end, I believe we need a couple of things. Come on, Christoph. My first point is we will need a willing and service. Come on, Christoph. We need a willing and surrendered spirit. Spirit. Turn. We need a Deuteronomy chapter four. Let's go, Stop. Come on, bro. Deuteronomy chapter four. And for the sake of time, all right, all right. We'll go to verse twenty-three. The Bible says, "Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that He made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God." You don't have to turn there, but Exodus 34, 14 says, do not worship any other God for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. And you see, the Bible here teaches us the nature of God, that he's a jealous God. He's a super jealous God. He's consumed with jealousy. God is so consumed with jealousy that his name became it, like his own name is jealous. But it's interesting because... You know how in the light and darkness Bible study, we, we go over to the Galatians 5 scripture right there. And, and you know, we go over to yeah, bro. talk about sin. And, you know, one of the sins is jealousy. And in that study, we usually ask the question like, like hey, Kwaku, do you know what jealousy is? And typically the answer we get is, oh, yeah, it's, it's wanting what someone else has. But we say, well, actually, what you're thinking of is envy. Envy is wanting what someone else has. But jealousy is fear of someone taking what you have. But now one would ask, well, if God is a jealous God, well, why is jealousy a sin? Because for any one of us to be jealous of someone taking what we have would falsely assume that we have ownership of anything to begin with. The Bible says in the beginning, it was God who created the heavens and the earth. God is oh the only person who has the right to be jealous because he created everything. And therefore, he owns everything. Come on, bro. Very jealous means he is supreme owner of all creation. The owner. But for us to be jealous would mean we are acting in the place of the creator. We're not God. We are nothing. We don't actually own anything. We ourselves, we're created beings. And, you know, we can only take what is given to us by God according to his plan that he has for our lives. But what does this have to do with surrender? You know, I believe many of us who are spiritually young disciples, which is everyone on this call, amen, except for Kwaku, um, we can be tragically unsurrendered about God's will for our lives. We need to understand that God owns us. He can do with our lives as he pleases. He created us. He bought us with his blood. But, but I get it, right? We can want things like I have ideas for my life. But we can somehow get into our minds that not being surrendered is like cute. Or like it's a casual sin, right? Like, yeah, I just really wrestle with surrender, bro. Like in general, like, okay, do you plan on repenting, right? But I'm learning this in a great way, family. We need to realize that being surrendered is absolutely satanic in nature. Absolutely. And why? 
Because when we are not surrendered to God's will and plan, we have somehow convinced ourselves that we know better than God. That what we want is far superior and greater than what God has in store for us. Come on, bro. And when we want to take things for ourselves and do with our lives as we please, we are in a very real way taking what does not actually belong to us. What do we call that? Thievery. You are attempting to rob God himself. <laughs> and who is the first person to do this? Satan himself. In John 10, Jesus says Satan is what? A thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan had his own ideal. Wow. He wanted things. He had a vision. He had a will for his own life. He wanted to exalt himself over the throne of God. And when he acted on this, he introduced to the universe a will that was foreign. It was outside the will of God. And we have to understand there's never meant to be a will other than the creator's. Romans 12 says God's will is perfect and pleasing. There's no need for another one. And Satan Preach. did not stay in his lane. He couldn't get surrendered about his role in God's leadership. And when we struggle with being surrendered to God's perfect and pleasing leadership, we act exactly like Satan. And, you know, speaking of, I want to talk about leadership for a little bit. And this is something that I have to wrestle with it. With wow. it Amen. Come on, bro. But I feel okay with calling my family to this as well. Come some on, of bro. us, and if you think I'm talking about you, I probably am. Um, some, some of us know deep down that you should be pursuing full-time ministry and you're not. Like you have the heart. You have the talent. Leaders believe in you. People have told you, hey, bro, I believe you can be an evangelist. Hey, sis, you can be a women's ministry leader. You can be a leader and go into the full-time ministry. But what stops you is that you get so caught up in your fears and your anxieties and your worries, your own ambitions, what you want to do for your life, and you make it about you, 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 and less about the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, and you lack a willing wow. and surrendered oh. spirit. Well, come on, bro. When God wants to raise you up to be a leader, oh my gosh. God, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. Like, don't think for a second that we have enough leaders. Like, we have an abundance of leaders somehow. Like, we need more. We have the whole entire Bay Area to get to. We have the whole Earth to get to. We still need to take SF State. We need to take over De Anza, San Jose State, Cal State, come on, come on, come on, bro. UC Berkeley. And let me tell you this. I believe the reason why we haven't smashed through 100 baptisms for the Lord is that because many of us have wasted precious time doubting the call of God that we wow. want to reach those that God wants to call. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I mean, look at Let's this. Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. Look at the gallery. We have the manpower. Look. We have the talent. We have the know-how. We've had 90 baptisms this year during the pandemic. Like, if we could baptize that many people during quarantine, you think we can blow out 100 by the end of December? Like, come on, absolutely stop. we can. And, you know, let's talk about something else. In two days' time, we have our final turning for Special Mission Sunday. And, you know, I, wanna, I want to lift up the Berkeley region. I mean, the young disciples really went after it right there. And, but I want to um, let you know in love. If you struggle with special missions, you've gotten away from giving up everything. Wow. You went from That's being completely nothing to being something worth $475. Or if you're a team, like a hundred bucks. Like it's not that much, right? But you've started to hold on to things. Hey, That's so good. Amen. Right? And we forget that God owns everything. And so when he asks us to sacrifice, whether it's our, our money or our future, right? We're simply returning to him what is rightfully his. But I believe that if we adopt a willing and surrendered spirit, not only will we blow our missions on Sunday, but we will stay faithful for 5, 10, 15, 20 years for the rest of our lives. Are you with me, church? Come on, bro. 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 Is if we want to stay faithful to the end, we will need a broken and contrite heart. A broken and and contrite heart. Turn with me to Psalm 51, and we'll close out here. Let's go, Christoph. Wow. Let's go, Christoph. This is awesome, bro. In Psalm chapter 51, this is amazing. Psalm verse 10. The Bible reads, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me 
a willing spirit to sustain me. Verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You know, this is the famous Psalm that David wrote after he drifted away from his first love. His heart, we see here, grew impure. His spirit grew faint. He lost the joy of his relationship with God. And he's crying out to God to get back to the beginning of what it was all about for him. And, you know, I love this song because I believe, and I've been here, we will get to this very same place as David many times as a disciple. Many times. And although the context of the scripture is heartbreaking, it's, it's encouraging and it's hopeful. God absolutely knows that we will get to dark places like this. And God being a good God who's sovereign will allow it to happen for the sake of transforming us. And he needs to transform us because we can't take it to the next level unless we change. Now, what has to change? Our hearts have to change. In Ezekiel 36, 26, you don't have to turn there. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And right here, I believe this is the goal of all the suffering in Christianity, to have a completely transformed heart, the heart of Jesus. And God says, if you want to make it to the very end, I have to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Your heart is too hard, and I need to soften it. And how is God going to do that? He has to smash us. He has to break us. David says, God doesn't actually need your sacrifices. What he really wants is your heart. But, but, but not that hard, selfish, crusty heart of yours. He wants a broken and soft heart. Crusty. Come on, bro. You know, I, as human beings, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm here with you. Come on. Plus, amen. Um, I think we can sum up all of our fears in this life into one simple thing. The fear of having our hearts broken. And we've all gone through that in some way, shape, or form, right? Whether it be tragedy, losing a loved one, financial hardships, losing relationships, breakups, death. I think we can sum all that up into the simple fact that we are absolutely terrified of having our hearts broken. Like, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to feel that, right? And naturally, in a real way, we can look at a broken heart, having our hearts broken as the end of the world. Like the end of the world right? Earth stops spinning because I went through something. And you know, in the world, that is kind of true, like, but not in the kingdom. A broken heart isn't the end of the world in the kingdom. It's the, actually the beginning of you living, right? Because it's this kind of soft heart that mm. God can use and is pleased with. And I don't want us to be mistaken in a real way. God is trying to kill you. You have a sinful nature. It's inside you, <laughs> right? He's trying to smash you. And he's trying to break the calluses Come on, bro. on our hearts. And only when we let God do this can we be fit to be the living sacrifices that he takes pleasure in. You know, no one's going to make it to heaven with a hard heart. Like, no one's getting in unless they're absolutely transformed. Wow. And having a hard heart, like, it can be tempting to, to resort to that, to protect yourself. It's self-preservation, right? But it kills us spiritually. It doesn't make us tough at all. And if we let God put the pressure on us, right, we don't have to get discouraged. We don't have to cower away from that. We get to rejoice in the hardship, like Paul said, the, the pain, the tragedy, like rejoice in the Lord always because God wants your heart. And if you let him have it, you're going to find yourself growing more and more in your love for him. And so we don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to get down. We don't have to lose heart and, and, and let our moods get sour. Let's be men and women of God who have the perspective that if we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he will lift us up in due time. We can't pull our hearts back. Come we on, have bro. to be willing to on, bro. hold it out for God to smash Come on. it because Come he's on, trying bro. to save us. Come on, bro. And you know, in the beginning, there was God and his word. And this we will so make it to the very end if we have a willing and surrendered spirit, a broken and contrite heart. 
Let's fight every day, month after month, year after year. Let's go back to the beginning where it's just all about God. Let us fight for our first love. And to God be the glory. I love you so much.